Good evening, a lot of people showed up tonight. That's nice. Come on, we'll sit down. Good, I'll talk to you later. Uh, the opening statement for me would be uh, what began as a businessman's idea to make some easy money turned into a magical place where fun, romance, and a sense of community flourished. Uh, we'll discuss the birth, uh, the quick decline, and the somewhat of a comeback of a truly American innovation and the outdoor drive-in theater. Uh, Richard Hollingshead is credited with the first drive-in theater, built it in 1933 in Camden, New Jersey. His dad, who had started off in the horse and buggy days, uh, making stuff for horses and buggies that people would add on, uh, had a business called the Wiz Auto Product Company. And uh, Richard, uh, worked for his dad, but he wanted to kind of do something on his own and make some serious money on his own. So he determined during the Depression, when people were really hurting, they would give up things in a certain order. Believe it or not, they gave up food first, <laughs> clothing, their automobile, and going to the movies. That was the order. So he figured, well, you know, maybe I'll take those last two things. If I can combine them, I can make some serious money here. So, First thing he tried to do, he was going to build a Hawaiian-style gas station where people lined up to wait for their gas. This was back when they had the, the glass fillers. They would hand pump those things up, and then they would gravity feed out. And if there was like 15, 20 cars lined up, it could take a while. So he figured, well, if they're waiting there, maybe they can pay a few cents and watch a silent movie on the side. So he thought about this for a while, and then he kind of shelved it and never went back to it. But he wanted to tap into a certain demographics uh, that were underrepresented in indoor theaters. Heavy set folks, uh, special needs people that they couldn't find a place to sit, smokers who would annoy everybody around, especially cigar smokers, uh, and families who normally couldn't go to the theater because they had to have babysitters and stuff and they normally didn't go. But he figured if there was a viable product, he'd figure it out. So one day, in his uh, driveway, he hung up a sheet uh, on a tree and he mounted a 1928 Kodak projector on the hood of his car. And he placed a radio behind the screen so he can get some audio. He volunteered his wife to drive around the lot and she was a dutiful wife. She drove all around the lot she would park the car and he would put blocks underneath and she'd drive up and he'd measure. Okay? And he got a, actually got a patent on it. The problem was when, when they first opened, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, when they first opened, people would watch the movie, you know, and they'd be kind of talking. And so they'd drive away. What they did was they would drive this way and they'd high center because it, <laughs> it dropped off about 21 inches. So he remedied that pretty quick. He put uh, berms up so you could drive up. And when you drove out, you drove down, took a right or left and got out of there. What he did was he bought land near Camden, New Jersey and put in his automotive movie theater. Uh, people said it cost about $25,000. He claimed it cost 60, but it was probably 25,000 because there wasn't a whole lot to do. He just kind of cleared the land and threw this stuff, stuff up and uh, he went with it. He uh, got together with some other investors, and one was a cousin of his, and they formed a corporation called Park Inn Theaters. He wanted to license the concept of putting cars up on these ramps. That was the concept that he patented. He erected a screen that was 30 feet high, 40 feet across, and about 12 feet off the ground. He went to RCA and said, I need some special speakers that are going to really put out the sound. So they developed these huge speakers, and he got three of them, placed them back here, okay? Now back then, you had to crank up the volume so these people back here could hear. They had to have their windows down, by the way, and in the summer, that was tough for the gnats and stuff. Not only for these people, but the people that lived a mile away. <laughs> they, they could all hear this stuff. And uh, another problem was, when these people saw the, 
cowboy fall off the horse, then they heard the shot. <laughs> there was the time delay. <laughs> so what he did then was he tried, well, heck, I'm going to make a trench, put some grading in, and put these speakers right underneath each car. Well, that didn't work very well either. Everybody just, it, it just wasn't right. Next. Okay. He had a very successful opening with broadboards touting privacy and comfort and the privacy of your own theater box. See, most people that worked didn't have a theater box when they went to theater, so now they had their own car and it was kind of their theater box. It made him special, made him feel real special, actually. And he ran an advertisement in local papers, uh, catering to those who didn't fit well into the, into the uh, regular theater seats. Believe it or not, back then, theaters were called hardtops, and these places were called ozoners. Ozoners were the outdoor theaters, and the hardtops are the indoor theaters. Uh, he also uh, offered shut-ins that could come free if they came with a paying uh, par uh, adult, and he would let them in free. So he was kind of doing his part to load up the theater. He operated this theater for th just three years, and he sold it. And he actually never ran another theater again but he did keep his share in the Park and Ride Corporation. The problem with that was within about two months, there was another theater that was built you know, about six miles away and they didn't pay him royalties for his patent. And that happened all over the country. These, these you know, mostly it was a lot of a farmer would decide he's gonna plow a field and put a, put a screen up and they didn't pay him. And he spent, oh, months and months and years in courts trying to get money from these people and they mostly didn't pay. And uh, what happened to the park and ride is by 1951, it was in and out of the courts and finally the First Circuit Court of Appeals nullified him altogether. So in 51, he had no more, no more patent rights to any of this stuff or, or any of the royalties that came with it. Next. <laughs> this is the Pico Drive-In. It was in LA and it was built in 1935. And they, they decided, well, heck, instead of having these speakers way back there, we're gonna put a big speaker in front of every car. So they had these speakers there, probably three feet by three feet in front of every car, and it worked great. The, the patrons could hear perfectly. Once again, two miles away, they could hear perfectly too. <laughs> and it just, they got some more, they had complaints all the time, and, and they, were, they were barely staying open because of all the problems. The thing is, they needed new technology badly, otherwise this whole thing was gonna fall apart. By 1939, there was 18, theaters nationwide. And it was growing marginally fast, but not real fast because of the problems they were having with the sound and all this stuff. And they were just still kind of feeling their way through the woods. And then when the war came, World War II, only six were built because all the material and stuff was going to the war effort. Also, there was not a lot of dads taking their families to driving because dad was in Europe or wherever. So, next. 1941, RCA introduced the first in-car speaker system, which you hung inside the window. This innovation was actually the turning point that saved the industry because now uh, they could keep the sound confined and they finally had control of their own product and didn't have to worry about superfluous sound getting out to other places and ruining everything and getting lawsuits and stuff. So that moved the industry forward. Next. In 1948, <laughs> this guy had an idea. I said, well, people can drive. Why can't they fly to these theaters? <laughs> so <laughs> there, was a, there was about five or six that were built. And you can see they got their speaker here. They're sitting out there, and there's the cornfield. They, were, they probably came in from over here somewhere. They would usually line them up in the back row. They would watch it, and then they'd bring out a Jeep, hook it up, tow it back to the flight line, and they were gone. So... But that lasted until about 1955. That was pretty much the end of it. I uh, really couldn't find anything after that where they thought that was something that they could make money at. Actually, one place in Florida, they did a fly-in, drive-in, sail-in. That didn't go over very well. I don't think that lasted a month or two. Okay, next. Okay, July 14th, 1948. The fabulous motor view opened between Bennett Drive and Highway 99. It was the road to Alaska, as they called it, which is now Maplewood. And even then, 
you can't read here, but they were still paying royalties to Parkin, because this is 48 and Parkin lost their royalties in 40 or in 51. This is probably taken right after it opened it. You notice there's no cars here that are probably, these are all in the 40s. There's no cars here, from, mostly in the 30s actually. Uh, remember going there even as a kid, oh, not, I'm not that old, but <laughs> I remember <laughs> driving in there, they had these Warner Brothers in, uh, in tubing, neon tubing on the side. I remember those, all these Warner Brothers, Porky Pig and Daffy Duck along the side. And when you went in there, you were, you were treated to a uh, myrophonic sound. Does anybody know what that is? I don't either. <laughs> a super high intensity lighting. Maybe they use that at prisons, I don't know. Uh, special ground optical systems. That's another thing that I have no idea what that is. And of course, the latest six inch car speakers in perfect monotone, which was good because at that time at home, you had maybe a 17 inch black and white if you had a TV at all, and the sound was probably worse there. The show opened, like I said, July 14th, 1948 at 9.45. Uh, the first speaker was ripped out at 12.05 when the first patron failed to remove it. <laughs> That's a fact, I'm not, I'm not making this stuff up. <laughs> Next. Okay, here's an aerial view taken in 1963. As you notice, the person who did this didn't know anything about it because he spelled it wrong. It's V-U, not V-I-E-W. Okay, this is Bennett. Do you notice Baker view isn't here because it went up here? They changed that later where it comes down here. This would be about where the Arco station sits now, right about in here. Okay, I'll give you a perspective. Next. It's 1970, well, 1997. It shows that it all kind of went to seed. It's even worse than that now. This kind of shows you where everything is. And they, you notice they moved Bakerview down here now. Comes here, here's the Arco station where you fill up your gas. And, and that shows you where it is. But there's really nothing left there. It's totally void of stuff. The Moonlight Drive-In, July 11th, 1953. It had a bigger screen than the Motor View. And the reason it opened at 53 is because the Motor View no longer had the territorial rights because that, that park-in they lost their royalties and they had a territorial area that they covered. Well, that was gone so they could build this. It was actually bigger. It had a 60 foot wide screen. And next. This is built on reasonably priced land. Here's the screen, you can see the screen. This is where Sherry sits right about here. Here's the Telegraph Road and, and, the, and Meridian. You notice it's not quite as busy as it is now. <laughs> you know, Red Robin would be sitting right about here, you know, and that's where the, the mall is. And this, this was the, the government bulb, bulb, uh, bulb farm. Uh, this is where Denny's is, where these houses are. Next. This is the Holiday Drive-In. It was located off Birch Bay Linden at Valley View Road. Okay, it opened on March 27th, 1961, showing the family feature, Third Man on the Mountain. Showed a lot of family stuff. But later on, attendance began to dwindle. In the later years, the theaters started to show a lot of X-rated stuff. <laughs> and it, unfortunately, it drew a loyal but small group and you know who you are. Okay. <laughs> Next. This is the 800-seat Viking Twin, opened in 1972. Arnold Larson, he also owned the Moonlight, and I think he owned the Motor View for a while. Uh, he called this whole complex uh, Cinema City, and this was the first multiplex in town. It had, you know, two 400-seat uh, theaters in there. But that was just the beginning as now we have, what, 16, you know, 24 theater complexes now. But that was kind of the start of it. And that was also the, one of the problems with the regular drive-in theaters. They just couldn't compete with that. There was two options instead of one. But he was able to put them all together. He, he, since he owned the Moonlight 2, he combined the whole thing. So he actually had three screens. Next. This is the opening night advertisement for the Viking Twin. See right here, it says Cinema City. 
that was all three of them together on Telegraph Road. That was, well, I can't, can't read it here, but that was the opening movies. They never got, one thing about the drive-ins, they never got first-run movies. They were kind of, uh, the, uh, the studios kind of frowned on them from day one. In fact, if you go back to uh, Hollingshead, his first movie, he paid $400 for four days. Well, the, the theater in town had the same movie, and they got 10 days for $20 for the same movie. So they, uh, they were always on the back burner when it came to getting the movies. That never really changed. Next. All right. This is the Samish Drive-In, 3801 uh, Byron Street. It opened in 1972. Had the all-time classic, Chateau's Land, starring Charles Broughton. Somebody, it should have won an Oscar. I, I firmly thought it should have. But uh, that was the opening for that. Next. Okay. September 1978, the moonlight closed, and the land was developed into a complex called Meridian Village, which is still there. It has places like Ross's Dress for Less, Cherry's, DeWard and Bodie, and a few others in there. That's still there. Next. With the moonlight closing, the Samish drive-in became the Samish Twin. Okay, this is in the same year, 78. They built another uh, screen at the opposite end, at the south end. Cost $18,000. And at that time, they put another projection booth in here, this KBFW radio station. KBF SRO, the Sterling Recreation, owned this radio station and that. So that's why that was kind of combined. Uh, the Samish uh, Twin closed in 2003. It was torn down in 2004. It was sold to Western as a uh, uh, park and ride station uh, in 2006. The thing is, this actually, this theater lasted longer than any the other. It lasted 30 years, where most of the others lasted at the most, I think, 29, 28, and some less than that. And several uh, factors led the tremendous decline in the number of drive-ins in the 70s and 80s. See, in 1959, there were over 5,000 drive-ins nationally. Uh, but then 3,000 closed in that 20-year period from the 70s through the 80s. 3,000 closed. And they were almost completely gone by 2,000. And there were several reasons that uh, combined to kind of almost seal their fate totally. One was... Daylight saving times, which was the hard toppers pushed really hard. That came in 1967. What happened there was instead of starting the movies at 8.30 or whatever, all of a sudden they were starting at 9.30. A lot of families couldn't go. People had to work the next day. So that, that really cut into the attendance. Multiplex theaters were becoming more in vogue. There was more of those, which means more, more selections. Somebody could go one place and have the option to see two, four, or six different you know, shows, whatever they wanted to see. Another thing about uh, drive-ins is they were seasonal. Okay, they were open during the warm months. Sometimes they opened in February, March, and they closed by October. It was cold. And uh, when they were closed, they're not making any money. So what some did is they, uh, they started doing swap sales, anything to get people there during the off times and, and uh, make, generate some income that way. But that still wasn't enough for a lot of them. They still, a lot of them went under then. Uh, another thing that uh, hurt them was the advent of the VCR and the tapes, DVDs at home. People could watch movies at home. And by this time, they, they didn't have the 17-inch black and white. They were getting nice, you know, color screens at home so they could watch this stuff at home. And outdoor theaters kind of maxed out their technology. I mean, you can only do so much. The, the screen was far enough away where... The, the brightness was still about one-fifth of what you could get from real theater. And, and the audio was still basically mono. Later on, they did finally switch over to uh, a, a low-frequency FM-AM uh, system, which allowed people to get these things on their radio instead of a speaker, because the speakers were really expensive to maintain, the old speakers. This was a lot cheaper. Uh, also, the indoor theaters were, were adding technologies like Dolby surround sound and IMAX and stuff that just couldn't, couldn't be duplicated to the outdoor theaters. 
Those were the big ones. But probably the last one, the real killer, was the mandated conversion to digital projection. And that had to be done by the end of 2013, which meant the studios were no longer setting out the 35 millimeter films. So they, all these, all these uh, drive-ins and, and small theaters had to convert and and the conversion ran anywhere from seventy to eighty thousand dollars. So a lot of these people were on a shoestring. So that wiped out a lot of these small mom and pop businesses. Uh, a local example would be the Pickford. They had to really scramble to get to digital because they would have probably gone under if they couldn't have switched over either. So it was it was a real dilemma. Next. Okay. This is the Verhaven Outdoor Cinema, produced by Epic Events, and uh, this is actually celebrating its. 15th year this year and runs probably I think from the middle of June through the later part of August and it does retain some of the the old aspects of the old drive-ins you got families watching together you can bring your own food or buy some there you have the choice pillows sleeping bags you know and they also had what which some of the major old theaters had they would have entertainment because when they went to daylight saving time, they had a lot of time to kill, so they had to come up with different things to keep people there until the show came on. They, they even had uh, monkey jungles. Several places had these monkey jungles where people could watch the monkeys. And they, and they had planes come over and drop raffle tickets, and they did all kinds of things to keep people there until the show started. They had trams, pony rides, uh, circus acts, whatever it took to keep people there. Okay, next. Okay, this is the Rodeo Triplex in Port Andrews. This, is, this was just last year. You notice they got, they're, they're broadcasting FM, so they're pick, they got an FM receiver, and they got speakers there, and they're sitting outside. You notice there's no poles anymore for the, for the in-car speakers. They're gone because they were just too expensive to maintain. Uh, actually, that, uh, the low-frequency thing came about about 67 or 68. This guy invented that. That was one of the things that kept these few theaters that are left going. Otherwise, they would have probably all been gone. They're just too expensive to maintain. So back in 1560, there were in the neighborhood of 70, 70 theaters uh, in Washington. And now there are five active theaters. So everybody wants to go to theater. There's still five of them around. There's one on the east side and four on this side. There's the Auto View Drive-In in Colville, if anybody's just happened to be going through Colville on their way to some... I guess you don't go through Colville if you're going to someplace else. You've got to be just going to Colville. All right. Uh, they have the Blue Fox. Anybody hear of the Blue Fox? That's just south of Oak Harbor. That's still in operation. Uh, the Rodeo Triplex, which was in the last picture, that's near Port Orchard. That's still running. The Wheel-In Motor Movie, that's in Port Townsend. And the Skyline, which is in Shelton, which is kind of interesting because this year they're celebrating their 50th year of being in operation. So they're hanging in there and they're doing good. And that's pretty much my presentation. It's a little bit transistorized, but like I said, but <laughs> now you get into shakes and fries and all that stuff. Mm. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about some drive-ins. We're going to start with the beginning. Uh, and so the first thing, what do you need for a drive-in? You need food, the right kind of food. So you can go ahead and... All right, here we go. I don't think that's King Tut, but somebody with a bird face. Oh, oh, sir. Oh, yeah, or whatever. <laughs> okay, I think that's a hamburger. And then right next to him on the wall, there's another inscription. Next. Oh, yes. Hold the pickles. <laughs> All right. Next slide. There we go. So when they dug up Pompeii, of course, you know, that was A.D. 79. And uh, they found some outdoor eating establishments. You could walk up to one of these and hand them a few shekels and, and walk away with a handful of, uh, well, like a pita sandwich or something like that. Uh, maybe a cow on a stick or something. 
And uh, there were a number of these restaurants in Pompeii. We toured that here a couple of years ago and uh, they had all of these. And I'm sure during the times when they were in the Colosseum watching gladiators and Christians get killed, they uh, probably had people work in the audiences there. At that time, most of the food you bought outside and then you took it home and you prepared it. Next. Oh, okay. Here's uh, an artist rendering of one of the food stores there in Pompeii. Um, so you would walk into one of these establishments and get a bowl of stew or soup or a piece of bread or whatever it was you wanted to do, have for a uh, snack. Later on, there were, uh, you didn't have really any big restaurants in those days. There wasn't any reason to have it because everybody cooked at home. There were a lot of bakeries in that town and whatnot. Uh, later on, a few centuries later, as people started to travel more, then you had the beginnings of the inns where you would, uh, the, the uh, transportation would stop for the night and you would have a meal and then uh, have a room to stay in. And uh, the meals were usually, in, in course, uh, included in the cost of the rooms. In the uh, 1100s in the Far East, they had a lot of holiday celebrations and there again, they had a lot of food vendors, street people who had maybe a tray of uh, monkey on a stick or something like that. Carrying on the tradition of portable meat, the Frankfurter was a popular food item in Germany in the 1200s. By the 1600s, fancy restaurants could be found in many of the cities, especially in the inns and hotels. The Wiener was developed in Vienna in the 1600s. In 1800, a Frenchman, darn it, made the first French fries. The potato wasn't really popular until that period of time. After that, people started eating more potatoes. By the 1800s, separate restaurants could be found anywhere in the towns and along the roads, and in the highways and the train depots and whatnot. And you could, the stagecoaches would stop for a noon meal and you didn't have to stay the night there, you could continue on your trip. In 1872, a gentleman by the name of Walter Scott opened a lunch wagon on the streets of Providence, Rhode Island, selling sandwiches and pie. And pretty soon there were three or four major companies making these uh, uh, sandwich wagons. And they were popular really back in the East, not much, so much in the West. Um, the first hot dog, as we know it today, was sold in 1880 in St. Louis, and by the Chicago World's Fair in 1893, they sold thousands of them. By 1900s, there were dozens of cafes, ice cream parlors, uh, food vendors lined the streets of most towns and cities. Uh, still, most food was prepared and consumed in the home. Well, worse, about that time, they opened their first lunch counter, soon followed by Newberries and Crests and Walgreens and they had dozens of hand carts rolling through the city selling hot dogs. In 1900, the first hamburger, a meat patty between two pieces of bread was sold by Louis Lassen in New Haven, Connecticut, although there's a lot of dispute involving who actually put out the first hamburger. Uh, of course, Hamburg, Germany claims, you know, a lot of that. Um, during the in 1904 at the St. Louis World's Fair, this relatively new sandwich was touted by the New York Times. Well, pretty soon every entrepreneur and restaurateur was cooking up a hamburger. It was quick to make, it was easy to make, everybody liked them. There you go. There's the first thing we needed was the food that you could carry in your hand and eat. In 1900, the first automobile arrived in Washington State. By 1908, several cars were traveling the streets of Bellingham. Now, they couldn't really go anywhere. There weren't any roads. They could only go in out by train or boat, but we had them. Uh, they slowly caught on, and instead of just being a fad, uh, they grew by huge numbers. And in 1918, there were 10, auto, there were 10 stores on, on uh, Cornwall within a five block area that either sold or repaired automobiles. 
There were 8 million cars on the road in the United States in 1920, and there were 23 million in 1930. I don't know how many there are now. <laughs> so, now we had two of the things. We had fast food and we had cars. But why should you have to get out of the car to eat? You really liked your car. The first drive-in, it was called Kirby's Pig Stand. It opened in Dallas, Texas in 1921. Now a drive-in is a restaurant that serves people food in their car. So you drive up, you park, somebody comes out of the restaurant, takes your order, goes back in, gets your food and brings it out to you. That is a drive-in. A drive-through is if you drive through to a window where somebody serves you through the window, you still don't have to get out of the car. A drive up is where you drive up, you park, you get out, you go to the window or into the door and you get your food and then you leave. Okay, everybody got that. That's the difference. In 1921, Allen and Wright opened their first drive-in in Lodi, California, featuring their root beer, A&W root beer. Next picture. This is the Hamburger Express. It opened in, eight, in 1933 at Northwest and West Maplewood. And uh, it was in the parking lot across the street from the credit union. And then later on, it moved to where the Northside Cafe is today. And at that time, it also added inside dining. But while it was, it, when it was first in place across the street, um, it was considered what you would call today as a drive up. Anybody know? There's nobody going to remember this one. <laughs> this is the first triple X in Washington State. It opened in 1937 in Birch Bay. Everybody knows where C, the C stop is, the C shop? Okay, if you continue on towards Birch Bay Drive, on the right-hand side on that corner, there's a building there. And this was there where that building is today. And I believe it still has a little cafe where they serve hamburgers there. This is a, about the time all this was going on, the first drive through restaurant opened in Springfield, Missouri in 1947. This is on Holly. This is Bob's. And the building to the right of it, well, you can see it looks like a railroad car. It's actually a building. That was the freezer. That, uh, Bob's opened in 1952, and I believe the freezer was before that. Yeah. It's the next picture. It was on Holly, well, we're across from the Wiku, along in that stretch. The building, Bob's building is still there. It's used as a classroom for Wiku. Yeah. Um, grand opening of Bunks. Now, I know most of you never went to Bunks. <laughs> It opened in 1956. It was formerly the Skookum Chuck, which opened in 1953, and I believe before that it was the, uh, when they moved the freezer, they moved over here. The uh, next picture. Lee's opened around 19, well, this is a picture taken around 1957, so I believe it opened in 1956 also. It was later remodeled for inside dining this is when it was across the street from where it is now. Next slide. In 1964, they opened a second restaurant up by the coal mine bridge, just before you cross over the bridge there on Northwest. On the right-hand side, it's a chiropractor shop today. Next. That restaurant, by the way, later became uh, called the coal miner. Ah, yes. Nobody ever went here either, right? <laughs> this is uh, a 1946 advertisement for the grand opening of Mastin's. It sat uh, on Samish Way, about uh, maybe half a block north of uh, the old Black Angus. On the right-hand side, there's a service station sitting there now. Next. This is a picture, a night picture. It's one of about five in existence. We, we found this by pure accident. 
This is after the addition of the, the marquee in 1954. Boy, bring back some memories. <laughs> Next picture. The seventh spot. How many know where this is? Okay, there's a few of you. This uh, was in 1957. It was leased for the short time, then it became the Chicken Village, then the coal miner, it's now that chiropractor's office. This is the 3200 block of uh, Northwest. Next. <laughs> okay. The, the shack was opened by Russ Hilton and Ralph Sawyer in 1955. And it was, of course, right across from Ballard High School. Or Ballard, I'm sorry, I graduated from Ballard. <laughs> <laughs> it's right across the street from Bellingham High. <laughs> well, we had one across from our Ballard, too. They moved it from where it was originally, out by the roadway, and they moved it back to the words of the house there and uh, had a grand reopening in 1962. You see the sign, we have sold. <laughs> yeah. 1,500,000 hamburgers at a quarter apiece. Sometimes they were sold, they had sales six for a dollar. Oh yeah. This is the shack. Oh, it is now, it's the Sandwich Odyssey. Yeah, they still have really great sandwiches there. <clears throat> Next. Okay. For you folks that live in Ferndale, this is the red top <coughs> drive-in. It sat where the, uh, the tire store is across from uh, uh, or over there next to uh, Hagen's. And uh, it opened in 1959. And uh, it was, it later on became Jack's. Now on this sign, I believe uh, this picture is taken shortly after that. You notice it says, home of the Jack Big Bun. So, um, this is when Jack Postlewaite bought the restaurant. And at that time, a young lady by the name of Linda Grant started working for Jack. And then, uh, later on, Jack's moved and built his own drive-in. Oh, okay, we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> Anyhow, he built his own uh, drive-in and became Jack, uh, Jack's drive-in. And then the Grants bought it and operated it for a few years as Grants Drive-In. And now it's, been, it's being operated by Kimberly Fox, the Grants' daughter. The Sonic sits now where Grants did. Yep. Waldo, I, don't, I forget his last name, it was a Dutch name. Yeah. Anyhow, he opened a drive-in in Linden and uh, somewhere around 1960, yes. Yeah, he is, he's 100 years old and he's still kicking. Uh, he later opened the rendezvous in 1967. Wins, yeah, Wins opened in 1964. Um, one of the problems that we're having with our book is that we know this building was moved from the north side of Bellingham through the streets in the middle of the night and was set on a foundation made for it. The building, that we, we have a picture of the movie in the building and it has A and W on it. So if anybody knows any information about that, would you please talk to us? <laughs> Thank you. This is Ray's A and W. What we're thinking is the original building was changed and rebuilt and that the old building was hauled somewhere. They were potentially going to make another drive-in on the north side, but never did. That was just taken in 1965. Next. The Arctic Circle. This is just down the street from Bob's, from the first picture of Bob's there on Holly. This is also part of the uh, Wiku complex. Next. Herfies, yeah, after uh, Bunks, this was the other one you did the big circle with every Friday and Saturday night. 
in your car. <laughs> Next. Big Daddy. Everybody knows where that was. That was down on uh, Holly, West Holly. It's now Jalapeno's Mexican food restaurant. Yeah. So the, uh, uh, you know, there's a, there were a lot of drive-ins. It's amazing how many there were. Uh, there were or were or are Grants, Barters, Morris, Triple X, Sornbergers, Boomers, Bobs, Chicken Delight, Dutch Treat, Tip Top. That was in Birch Bay. KFC, Ralph's, The Shrimp Shack, Taco Time, The Varsity, The Candle, Chuck's in Blaine, Dunny's in Nooksack, and of course McDonald's, Dairy Queen, Jack in the Box, Burger King, Sonic, Taco Time, Taco Bell. There was one other taco treat. Uh, Wendy's, Neener Neener Wiener, Subway, Quiznos, Skippers, some pizza parlors, and a few others I don't remember. <laughs> Next, do you remember the big to-do when they opened McDonald's and Reg Williams, the mayor, came in and cut the tape? Mm -hmm. McDonald's now sells over half a billion hamburgers a year, proving that not a lot of the food consumed in the U.S. is not at home anymore. Pardon? That's the front of the McDonald's restaurant down uh, just off the freeway in downtown. Yeah. Yeah, the same place. Yeah. That's a row of $50 bills he's cutting. And that money was donated after the program was over. They had Ronald there, the first Ronald. Ugh. <laughs> Oh gosh, how many are there? Three, four? You know, I think you know why this was such a big deal. You weren't anybody if you didn't have a McDonald's. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I remember that. In 2014, the only dri true drive-in restaurants in, in Whatcom County right now are the Sonic and Boomers. Thank you.